Good evening. Thank you for joining this second uh, research seminar in Islamic art or Russia. Um, I'm very happy that many people are here already. Um, I'm very happy also to introduce Dr. Natasha Morris, who is our speaker tonight. Um, Dr. Natasha Morris is currently an associate lecturer in the arts of Islam um, and Iran at the Quarterly Institute. She has previously been Moijin Nadar project, project curator for modern Middle Eastern art at the British Museum. She's an alumna of the Quartal. She's done her BA, MA, PhD there. Um, and she's also taught at UCL and has written on the arts of Iran for a number of publications, including The Guardian, The Berlito Magazine, and even Time Out. Uh, Natasha is the author of several exhibition catalogues on contemporary artists from the Middle East and was co-author of Hunar, the Afghami collection of modern and contemporary Iranian art, uh, which was published in 2017. And more recently, Reflections, Contemporary Art of the Middle East and North Africa, uh, which was the catalog of an exhibition at the British Museum to 2020. And Natasha next year will also be the co-convener of Islamic art uh, of the uh, Asian art uh, postgraduate diploma that sits in the School of Arts in SOAS. Uh, so uh, please, as usual, write your questions or discussion points in the chat. And Natasha has kindly agreed to, to have discussion through chat after the seminar. And I will then read uh, your questions out at the end of it. Okay, well, uh, welcome, uh, Natasha, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for your kind introduction. And also my thanks to you and Tanya and Matty for organising everything so smoothly um, during a pandemic. So, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming along. Uh, tonight's presentation is a condensed version of the research that went into the final chapter of my doctoral thesis which is currently being worked into a book. And the endeavour as a whole um, is an exploration of masculinity and the male image in the art of Qajar era Iran. And this is a period spanning most broadly uh, 1789 to 1925. And my study um, perhaps turns the expected approach to this material on its head, as I end with, um, rather than beginning my inquiries, with the following examination of images of the zenith of masculine power, um, both profane and sacred. So that of the Shah and by extension that of the Shi Imams. I'm doing this through a case study of Qajar era portrait miniatures. So these small pendant portraits that are often on watercolored ivory, ceramic or enamel, are each examples of a medium that was at its most popular in Iran during the mid to late 1800s. The ubiquity of medallions at this time um, was partially due to the incorporation um, of such kind of miniatures into the order of the imperial effigy or Temsale Humayuni under Nasruddin Shah Qajar in 1848. Although immediately we can see that these are related to the European equivalent in composition and form, I will argue, however, that these are conceptually closer to the bodily placement of religious roundel portraits, known as Shemael, and physical behaviours that were enacted towards the monumental life-size oil painting of the period. What I mean by conceptually here is the treatment of the images. Um, that's both devotionally and bodily by both their beholders and also the relational power that they're then seen to contain. So this has substantial implications for how Qajar portrait miniatures can then be read as gendered objects, which are part of the masculine visual and material culture of the period. 
So within this presentation, I will be drawing on Persian concepts concerning the uh, psychology and symbolism behind figural image making, as well as contemporary uh, textual sources about public and private responses towards the iconography of both Shah and Saint in the 19th century. So here we have an early portrait of Muhammad Shah Qajar, who reigned between 1834 and 1848. This is dated to within the first decade of his rule. And we see it residing here in a decorative gold frame that's studded with diamonds. So aside from having such a brilliant surround, uh, the enamel roundel at the center of this precious object is an equal subject of awe. The richly ornamented costume of the king is peppered with shards of diamond that accentuate the aigrette, which is attached to his hat, as well as the fastenings of his silk overcoat and the armbands or bazu bands that are worn over the top. Despite its diminutive proportions, so this object is a kind of palm sized 10 by 8 centimeters, it is still a vision of wealth and material luxury. The likeness of Muhammad Shah himself is enshrined in a smooth oval of enamel. So the image of the king then becomes a treasured jewel at the center of the pendant proper. Now the use of enamel, like lacquer, uh, was a technology that grew in popularity and refinement under the Qajars and allows for a rich palette with this kind of certain luminosity that is particularly evident in areas of skin and silk. As an object, therefore, it has this compelling tactile as well as visual appeal that invites you to touch it and hold it. The sensuous mixing of textures, the glittering shine of the surface, and even the appealing novelty of its small scale are all qualities that give it an almost magical, tangible allure. So attached to the frame of the portrait are two small loops of gold. Um, I believe the pin is a later addition, and I've highlighted these here. In any case, the portrait was intended to be worn, to hang close to the body and to be felt and displayed upon the chest in alignment with the heart. So this particular attachment to kind of a body object articulation in the function, materiality and display of the Qajar era portrait medallion is the central hinge of this paper enabling us to read them as explicitly masculine coded objects that formed part of the imperial and religious body, both collective and individual of the Khajar Shahs. So this human connection of these objects images is particularly charged. From the large body of visual evidence that we have in which they're depicted on the lapels of courtiers and kings, we can discern that in their Persian manifestation, portrait miniatures were primarily worn on the chest of the male body. And this is rather than being secreted away in albums, pockets or drawers, as their contemporary equivalents were elsewhere. And this is particularly important um, concerning those that were owned by women. This mode of public, specifically bodily display, as I will argue, was tied up in the explicit gendering of the Khajar portrait miniature as male, and therefore produced an entirely different sentimental drive to those miniature traditions that were more expressly implicated in colonial European manners of wear, collection and display. In the statement of wearing the miniature on the chest in the Khajar mode, the male body then acts as an exhibitionary space. Most importantly, this is a canvas that is primarily supplied by the bodies of the elite. As a behaviour that was limited to the imperial and bureaucratic echelons of Khajar high society, it had a tenuous cognate equivalent in the societies of 18th and 19th century Europe. In Napoleonic France, for example, a small portrait medallion, which was usually drawn and then engraved, was used to represent a male sociability that was enlightened. 
So it represented loyalties to politicians, um, the admiration of a particular artist or writer or musician, um, kind of connective bonds between friends. Um, it one was basically a democratized departure from its previous use as a signifier of royal attachment. And this is of course because of a changing social political landscape which also necessitated the repurposing of the um, genre of a portrait miniature following the interruption of state-sponsored commissions. In fact, this fraternal significance of the portrait miniature was recognized as so significant that the period of 1789 to 99 witnessed a real proliferation of their creation. However, this fraternal linking is the closest worn equivalent we have to its use in Khajar culture, where it is a medium that remained entirely reserved and entirely worn between men of a higher social strata. <clears throat> so when wearing the miniature, there is a direct connection made between both an image of a man and the bodies of other men. So as well as the likeness being encased in diamonds and pearls, as the miniature itself is, there is this further visual and physical linking of two male subjects, which is of such symbolic importance that it is often re-inscribed again as a motif in large scale portraiture. And we also see it later in photography. So here we have two examples of the portrait miniature being represented as a key part of men's imperial apparel. So a cursory glance shows us <clears throat> their visual and material affinity with not only other chivalric orders, um, which may surround them as part of a quasi-military royal regalia, but also with the trimmings, those bazu or armbands, the aigrettes and the epaulets. There is also here the ubiquitous blue sash that is worn by both Prince and Shah, which was also reserved for the outfitting of the ruler and his progeny. We know through primary sources that Khajar portrait miniatures were understood as connective devices between men. Medallions activated authority and established relationships between men through this physical act of wearing. So in the diaries of Sultan Ahmad Mirza Azadawle, the 49th son, of Fat Ali Shah Khajar, he writes that Hossein Ali Mirza Farman Farma, another of the late Shah's extensive progeny, um, would wear a pearl studded image. And this is referred to in his diaries as Temsale Humayuni or Temsale Mubarak Shah and Shah. So literally the auspicious likeness or portrait of the king. Such portraits as described by Sultan Ahmad are not dissimilar to extant examples that show Fat Ali Shah, arguably the most glamorous um, ruler of the dynasty. And we see here him pictured at the center. His account also places emphasis on the wearing of the miniature. And this is again evidenced by the looping that is placed on the reverse and the top of the frames. So this attachment to wearing the royal portrait is further underlined when miniatures are reinscribed in large scale portraits. We see this particularly with those of Muhammad Shah, who was frequently pictured with a portrait of Fat Ali Shah, his grandfather and predecessor. And this again was pinned to his chest as part of his richly ornamented military inspired costume in a continuation of this thread of dynastic continuity and patrimonial reverence. And it's most notably during and after the reign of Muhammad Shah Qajar from 1834 to 1848, that the increasing popularity of portrait miniatures was driven by a conceptualization of the authority of these objects as con connective devices. So it's acknowledged their power in creating and emphasizing relationships between figures of masculine authority that were then knowingly activated through the physical act of pinning and display on the chest. <clears throat> so looking closer here at these two portraits of Muhammad Shah, 
we can discern the portrait proper within the roundel of the miniature that he is wearing. Uh, in this case, each of the larger portraits of Muhammad Shah Qajar are sporting this smaller image of his predecessor, Fat Ali Shah. And again, this is not dissimilar to the ones that were described in the diaries of Sultan Ahmad Mirza. So this likeness of Fat Ali Shah is discernible even from a slight distance. And this is owing to his long black beard and the length of the Khajar Khayana crown, which together create his signature silhouette. The evocative power of the Khajar portrait miniature spoke to a specifically Persianate notion of the encasement of the essence or meaning, matna or matni, of the subject within an image, surat. This dynamic is evident in written accounts we have of encounters with large scale Khajar portraiture. Um, the weapon of choice that was used to consolidate the earlier rule of Fat Ali Shah. These paintings were recorded as having been received with as much excitement as if it had been the Shah himself. So here we have two foreign observations on the treatment of portraits of the Shah at public presentations within a decade or so of each other. Firstly, the British diplomat Sir John Malcolm commented on crowds showing marks of respect towards the image that were, quote, hardly short of those that would have been shown to the sovereign himself, unquote. Later on, the Russian general Yermolov recounted along similar lines that portraits in general, particularly those of the Shah, received, quote, the same external marks of respect as the persons themselves, unquote. And this created an atmosphere of reverence um, that was, quote, as if the king had actually been present, unquote. So viewer behaviours towards the image that we see illustrated by these accounts, with actions such as genuflection and salutation, were both bodily and emotional involvements that mirrored those um, that would have been similarly conducted in the physical presence of the king himself. Furthermore, there's the connection that a Persian understanding of portraiture has with the distillation of an individual's essence within their appearance. And this is fundamental to this relational understanding of the portrait miniature. So these dual concepts of matna and surat that were most notably described by the 16th century artist Sadiqi Beg Ashar in his Canon of Forms, and that are also attested to in numerous later literary sources, um, are remarked upon as being a specifically Persian response to images. So Yves Porter wrote on the form and meaning of portraits in the Safavid period, quoting Siddiqui Beg's treatise um, in an explanation of a Persian sense of realism, which was positioned as differing from the Western imagining of verism. So, Instead, the Persian approach sought, quote, away from the formal image, surat, towards the inner meaning, matna. So I want to foreground these concepts here as they can provide an indication of where localized ideas of accessing the persona or the subject of the image beyond its surface likeness can come from. So Gaja miniatures <clears throat> are also recorded as having been exchanged, often in lieu of the actual physical presence of the subject. Although he's not pictured wearing miniatures in the manner that his successors were, small framed portraits of Fat Ali Shah Khaja were frequently conferred on foreign envoys and other dignitaries in exchange for their services. And this was done as well within the court itself as a sign of the monarch's personal favour. The Scottish diplomat uh, Dr John McNeil, for example, received a medallion of Fat Ali Shah set in diamonds for his assistance during the negotiations that led to the Treaty of Turkomanchai in 1828. And also a subsequent miniature was also produced locally 
based on his own portraits of the Shah. Portraits of European sovereigns were in turn gifted to the Persian court. And this is a diplomatic practice that perhaps seems relatively unsurprising, given what we know historically about the etiquette of gift giving um, between different kingdoms. But this is a dynamic that continued to inform the production and symbolism of these object images throughout the 1800s. With the reign of Muhammad Shah commencing in 1834, the meaning and utility of portrait miniatures in the Persian vernacular had shifted somewhat. Portrait miniatures with Muhammad Shah as um, the subject himself are exceedingly rare, with the third Khajar monarch preferring instead to adorn himself with the image of his predecessor. And this was also done rather than widely disseminate his own portraits amongst his own court or to diplomatic guests. So these choices are important. Muhammad Shah is not positioned in scholarship um, as a member of the Khajar family line, who was renowned for his investment in the visual arts. Nor is he known for the kind of sustaining his own idiosyncratic tradition of portraiture. Comparatively, his 14 year reign was brought to an end aged 40 um, after suffering with the disease of kings, gout. And unlike his grandfather, many of his offspring did not survive infancy. Perhaps as a result of this, his time as Shah is reported more quietly with an emphasis on his sickly demeanor and a more insular tendency towards his own religious interests. His entire persona therefore is a marked contrast to the splendor and prowess of his grandfather, Fat Ali Shah, a figure who was ardently invested in his own image, as well as siring as many children as he possibly could. So an extant example from around 1845 of a miniature of Fat Ali Shah is recorded in the Nasadi Khalili collection of Islamic art. Not only does this roundel depict Muhammad Shah, but he is also rendered again in this signature Khazai military dress, pinned to which is yet another portrait miniature, again of Fat Ali Shah. So here we have a portrait within a portrait. As he is not patronizing um, the monumental art style that his predecessor was, Muhammad Shah's penchant for sporting a miniature speaks of a kind of emulation by proxy, rather than enacting a more direct homage in his own mode of rulership and patronage. So he, as if he is aware of the legacy with which he is tasked to continue, but he has invested his own less grandiose means of consolidating his rule. The rarity of examples of his own likeness, both in miniature and life-size formats, indicates that perhaps there was a level of unconcern towards manifesting his own image, and a concern instead with the talismanic properties of his forebear, who had already dedicated his rule to cultivating a highly assessed aura of kingship. Portrait miniatures, those um, that are expressly concerning an individual of some esteem, also share this characteristic um, that allows them to act as a re repository of the essence um, of the subject depicted. However, this is not achieved by their size, as it was with oil paintings, which were often life-size or indeed grander. But instead, this is done through those anthropological concerns with human object entanglement, specifically their necessity to be worn and therefore connected to the body of another, rather than simply sawed away or placed in an album or other repository. So in seeing a portrait of the Shah, then in turn wearing a miniature portrait of his ancestor or even his spiritual source of power, and this is something that we will examine shortly, also implicates the viewing agendas and trajectories of the Shah's own seeing practices and gaze. So what I mean by this is how he saw himself and then how he defined himself in relation to those with whom he was both physically and conceptually aligned through this image. The crisscrossing of these gazes then, between wearer, subject and beholder 
is interwoven with the material charisma of the object itself and its inherent ergonomic and visual tactility. Khajar portrait miniatures existed as a constant invitation to look, to touch and to revere the men who were associated with them. They were not only indicative of how viewers see these works, the outer surat, and by extension feel them, that connection made to the inner essence, but are also significant of how the Qajar kings saw and felt themselves to be, their masculine subjectivity, if you will. Despite having such associative power, the diminutive size of portrait miniatures and the fact that they have often been executed in the media of watercolour on ivory, gouache on card or painted enamel, has often relegated them to the margins of a genre more widely associated with the grand public images or psychologically penetrating evocations of a subject in more stately oil on canvas. Not only this, but although Khajar portrait miniatures have appeared in major exhibition catalogues um, on art of the long Khajar century, this is from the generative royal Persian paintings in 1998 and its companion Khajar portraits in 1999 um, to most recently L'Empire de Rose in 2018. They have yet to be the sole subject of inquiry as to their role in the process of creating and disseminating the royal image, and so this remains under considered. A recent inclusion of a collection of portrait miniatures within the British Museum in exhibition inspired by the East, which ran from October 2019 to January 2020, simply describes them within the catalogue as, quote, medals that represent Middle Eastern responses to European practices, unquote. So such a simplified statement is part of a wider dismissal of Qajar portrait miniatures as being purely derivative of European examples. Um, without due attention paid to the local resonances of the medium as something portable, tactile, emotive and associative within the vernaculars that were specifically both Persian and Khajar. So there's little solid evidence as to how and why the portrait miniature was so enthusiastically absorbed into royal Khajar iconography during the first quarter of the 19th century. Julian Raby describes the development of chivalric orders, placing both portrait miniatures and the Shira Korshid, the Order of the Lion and Sun medallion under this rubric. But this was done as one aspect of, quote, European influence, unquote, that had begun to take hold, quote, increasingly in the 1850s and 1860s, unquote. So the origin of the medium is positioned as undoubtedly European. And the adoption of the miniature prototype into Khajar visual culture is again corroborated by Ingvild Fastekud, <clears throat> who argues that this was as a result of contact with Mughal and Ottoman examples via the circulation of European originals. So these versions of events are key as they situate the portrait miniature firmly within a broader context of transcultural and diplomatic exchange with Europe. However, most examinations of miniatures pinpoint the beginning of the Khajar fascination with the portrait miniature far later than we have the earliest um, examples of both the Order of the Lion and Sun and these Tem Saleh um, during the reign of Fat Ali Shah at the beginning of the 19th century. Each account also perhaps stops short of explaining why portrait miniatures were then adopted differently in the Indian subcontinent and the Ottoman Empire. Whilst the Khajars married its formal and material appeal with the Shemoyel of Shia saints and pre existing local traditions of working in miniature, that then again further distanced the Khajar iteration of the portrait miniature away from any European archetype. A familiarity with the conceptual, formal and technical qualities of the portrait miniature have been achieved through the exchange of diplomatic niceties. However, there's also a consideration to be made of how Persian knowledge of the European version became interlinked with local traditions of small scale portraiture, 
which both predated the European archetype and developed concurrently to its appearance in Iran. The, speci the specificity of enamel um, is also a key part of this narrative, given the Khajar investment in the medium. Although a preference for enamel may be distinctive of a local taste, Khajar miniatures generally follow an archetypal circular round or shape, with some extending into a teardrop oval. So the latter of these settings was chosen for an early miniature by Bakhir, um, a court artist under Fat Ali Shah, which shows the monarch resplendent and rosy cheeked against the backdrop of a palace wall, complete with a luxuriant pink curtain um, in a composition that is a condensed version of a larger painting that was also the work of the same artist. The markers of the Shah's physical magnificence so those long connected arches of his eyebrows, the beauty spot or mole so beloved by poets, and the rouge cheekbones that flush from beneath his beard are all traditional marks of male as well as female beauty that still had currency during the period of his rule. And all of the metaphors that are used in poetry to circumscribe the preciousness of this desired physical ideal are here embodied in the materiality of the miniature itself. Again, this kind of uh, luminosity of the enamel which lends his countenance um, to this kind of inner silken light and extends to the frame, which is just as prettily rendered and elegant in its form as its subject. The frame itself is simple but unusual based on a 17th century Mughal style turban pin or tulip. Such framing is evocative of a desire to create a top to toe cohesion within a costume, complementing and mirroring the shape of the aigrette, which is worn by Fat Ali Shah that is twisted around his astrakhan hat. So the frame appears as if it was wound from the green stems of flowers, which then bloom at the narrow tip of the frame. The artist's signature is also placed in a bulb at the figure's right shoulder. This is a choice shape that further echoes the form of the frame and enhances this feeling of delicacy and whimsy, whilst undergirding the suitability of this uh, kind of visual parallel to the imperial turban pin in framing the portrait of the Shah. The importance of the miniature in the accessorizing of the royal body can be understood within the broader material treatment um, of luxury accessories in painting. And this is a category into which the portrait miniature falls. So the worn portrait exists as part of the larger decorative repertoire of the body of the king, where his entire being can then be seen to sparkle erratically. This process of reinscription was not limited to large scale portraiture, as some of the clearest examples of the reinscription of portrait miniatures can be found in works on paper. So, this is a portrait of Muhammad Shah in the British Library by Muhammad Hassan Afshah, and this is part of an album of collated images of Persian nobles. And it shows the king bedecked in royal regalia and gems which sparkle thanks to these wispy lines of white um, that shoot off from every diamond and pearl. And I've given a, a detail here of the original image so you can see this close up. An ovoid portrait of Fat Ali Shah, which is set in a frame that's dripping with teardrop shaped gems is pinned to Muhammad Shah's breast on his left hand side. The frame is topped with a crown that's surrounded by um, diamond encrusted plumage that echoes the crowned head of his grandfather within the miniature. Although there are no facial details visible, Fat Ali Shah again is further identifiable as the subject of the portrait miniature thanks to his copious beard, which extends to at least three times the size of his head. The glint of the frame of the portrait miniature on Muhammad Shah's chest is the primary device that catches the eye in Muhammad Hassan Afshar's painting. It is a miniature aura of pearls, diamonds and light around the picture of his grandfather, 
and this is melded within the overall adornment of his own body. So again, we have these similarly finished epaulettes, bazoo bands and cuffs, creating a frame of reflected light around his person. The ostentation of the frame provided yet another avenue for the artist to explore his virtuosity in rendering the sparkle of the jewels. Yet the fluffy sparks of white also suggest some difficulty in doing justice to the deflection of light against so many glittering surfaces that were presented by the king's outfit. In fact, each of the Qajar Shahs has an idiosyncratic approach to the portrait miniature and how they intended to express and consolidate their own power. So we move on now to Nasruddin Shah, who ruled from 1848 to 1896. <clears throat> and he was a narcissist in comparison to Muhammad Shah. His visage still adorns kitschy dinner services and behesh teapots that can be found in the China cupboards of most Iranian households today. So where his investment was in slapping his face on everything and everyone, there are countless paintings of members of the court and government officials who are sporting a miniature of Nasser Adin in his own time as a gesture of loyalty. So his penchant was not to link himself with one of his forebears by pinning a miniature of his father or his grandfather to his chest, but instead to draw the image of Imam Ali closer to his own. So this notion of charisma, both holy and imperial, is particularly pertinent in this regard. The portrait miniature um, as an object that both held and incited emotive power, um, especially when deploying the image of an imam, integrates um, the genre within a wider context of the codification of Shia material culture in the Qajar period. So unlike large scale portraits, the intended place of a miniature is not as uh, is not as a, at a distance. Um, it's not intended to be grasped by sight alone. The qualities conveyed through its tactility and its small scale therefore demand a close viewing practice that involves both a bodily and emotional investment on the part of the beholder. Royal portraits and other representations of the royal effigy have always played a crucial role in the cultivation and communication of monarchical power in Iran. From the command of coinage and base relief during the ancient glories of the Achaemenid and Sassanid dynasties, through royal representations of Safavid kings in illustrated manuscripts or directly painted onto palace walls, to so these portrait paintings of the Qajar monarchy that were framed and sent to audiences in lieu of the Shah, Iranian rulers have consistently relied on portraiture, albeit in different iterations of media, to both symbolize and consolidate their sovereignty. So these traditions began at their most epic in being literally embedded into the face of the land before then seesawing between the monumental and the miniature across the ruling dynasties of the ancient Persian empire through to the state of Iran of modernity. The fundamentals of Persian kingship extend back for centuries, whilst the preferred mediums depended to a greater extent on the mode of rule. Each king was expected as part of the, his embodiment of ideal kingship to then live up to this ideal. So the conflation of divinity and humanity um, was exemplified in both the political authority and the visual culture of early modern Iran. In establishing Twelve Shiism as the state religion, Safavid rulers were at once Sufi sheikhs and Shi'i monarchs, whose genealogy linked them with the prophet Muhammad, propagating a cult of kingship to which placed a great deal of emphasis on the adoration of the people of the house, namely the immediate family of the prophet Muhammad. Similarly, the Qajar portrait miniature gained its power from the Shi'i approach to monarchy that had been delineated by the Safavids. The role of embodiment in the representation of the Shi'i saints in image and practice was repeated by the Qajars and taken to its logical conclusion with the invention and wearing of the order of Imam Ali, 
It was established under Nasruddin Shah Qajar for his exclusive wear. The order was ultimately still a portrait miniature in its form and appearance. And as per the Qajar iteration, this still necessitated a bodily connection to the chest in the manner of images of the Shah. The continued interdependence of the royal with the holy image underscores how far kingship and religion were understood to be complementary. This played an enduring part in the cultivation of the ruler's divinely sanctioned self-image throughout the 19th century. When we see portrait medallions affixed to the uniform of Nasruddin Shah, these are often aligned with the order of the lion and sun, um, and on close inspection, we can see that there are also instances of the order of Imam Ali. And this was instituted under Nasruddin Shah in 1856. And this was an honor that outranked all others. Just like images of the Shah, portrait miniatures of Shi'i saints were worn as a mark of devout loyalty. And further to this, they signified a very personal alignment with this persona. They were pinned, not on the chests of the royal coterie as the Shah's own likeness was, but only at the breast of the king as his sole preserve. For the Shah to sport a picture of Imam Ali was to make both a, vis a visual and physical connection with the only other individual above his own station as king, and who therefore was worthy of a similar material treatment in being recast as a precious object. So it was not just the likeness of the royal self, Temsale Humayuni, which was encased in a roundel of diamonds and pearls. Khajar portrait miniatures are beset within a context of both physical charisma and material charm. And this included not just the ter terrestrial Shah, but the aspirational and devotional qualities of the Shi'i Imams. Secreted within book bindings and mirror cases, enclosing the image of Imam Ali, demanded a close considered reception from the beholder, which again included a bodily interaction with the image object by way of opening, touching and caressing. Placing the Imam within a golden roundel, and this is a surround that's often punctuated by foliated decoration and jewel-like embellishments of color, established a sacred aura around the image and also foregrounded the framing of the holy persona as a portrait medallion. Moreover, as part of this tactile heritage, <clears throat> images of the Imam Shemael that were involved within ambulatory rituals that were associated with Ashura, <clears throat> the 10th day of the month of Muharram, necessitated a degree of physical contact in that these had to be carefully held during parades and performances. As portraits of the Shah traveled and were exchanged or stood in for him in diplomatic absence, portraits of Imam Ali, if not more statically set into the bindings of Qurans or sensitively um, depicted in leaves of watercolor, were also involved in the ambulatory rituals of viewing and reception, Shemayel Gardani, during the month of Muharram. Miniature portraits, in their diminutive size and both formal and semiotic closeness to medallions, represent portraiture in its most portable iteration. Despite the often circular composition of Shemayel being easily translated into a miniature format, it is their portability that brings the portrait miniature into the closest comparison. <clears throat> Moreover, both Shemayel and the portrait miniature necessitate a connection with the body in order to activate the symbolic potential of the object and underline a sense of emotional investment towards the subject shown within its frame. Imaginary portraits of the Shia Imams <clears throat> therefore share compositional, material and conceptual parallels with those of the Qajar kings and as such, are also taken into consideration within this talk. Portrait miniatures of Imam Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, have a particular role to play.
play in this regard. So instigated in addition to the imperial effigy during the rule of Nasser ad-Din Shah, miniatures of Imam Ali became an expression of the pious self, aligning the monarch and by extension the nation with the Imam. Just like images of the Shah, portrait miniatures of Imam Ali were worn as a mark of devoutness, and further to this, they, they signified a very intimate alignment with this persona. Shemayel are in particular symptomatic of a wider reinvigoration of Shi'i religious cultural output that was stimulated at both civic and imperial levels of patronage during the 19th century. <clears throat> and this included the visual performative rituals of Tazie and Pardé. Portrait miniatures of both Shah and Imam were worn as a symbol of either royal or pious devotion. And by extension, they were a signal of homosocial loyalty and virtue. The two were frequently conflated as multiple pendants of both sacred and profane subjects were often worn together. And this is evidenced here by this portrait of Nasruddin Shah posed in a European chair by Bahram Kirman Shahi where the Shah is wearing both the Order of Imam Ali and the national emblem of the Order of the Lion and Sun. And these are pinned in a small diagonal from his chest to his throat, which draws complex political and religious semantics. Our understandings of this physical and material duality of masculinity and its inherent power are then informed by theoretical applications of the physical and esoteric division of a masculine persona of supremacy, most notably that of the king's two bodies. So Kantorovitz's literary-based concept considers the entity of the crown as, as comprising of two halves. And this is epitomized by the statement, the king is dead, long live the king. These two parts respectively named as the body natural and the body politic. Kantorovitz covers the rupture of the king's physical and spiritual political beings into two entities of authority, one that corresponds to his temporary presence on earth and the other his immortality by divine right and his position as a theological and corporate figurehead. However useful in approaching what is a largely universal notion of divinely sanctioned kingship, reminiscent of the Khajar notion of the Shah as God's shadow on earth. It doesn't go as far to encompass the ability that this power has then of transference or association. So there is a need to investigate how this would relate to Persian epistemological notions of both kingship and image making. What the duality that Kantorovich describes, however, can do for a reading of Khajar portrait miniatures is to help to investigate how local ideas of being and essence can operate in relation to the royal image. How the body of the king can be split, not only conceptually, but also in terms of the corporeal and material. How associations between men can still be made, for example, through the wearing of the miniature as both a visual and sensory act of touch, connecting another body's essence despite its physical absence. These relationships were created and maintained by miniatures which operated across temporal boundaries and their qualities as gifts which establish social relationships and continually act upon their wearers. Miniature portraits are, in the sense of Alfred Gell, artifacts with agency. So to conclude, within art history as a whole, and not just within the realms of Persian material, portrait miniatures are a rather minor branch of inquiry. Although Khajar era miniatures have cropped up in exhibition catalogue essays, such publications, although extremely helpful, are largely descriptive efforts. Portrait miniatures have yet to be the sole subject of inquiry as to the process of creating and disseminating the royal image. And so far, there has been little to say regarding the miniature's role in the larger visual culture in which it functioned. Kajar portrait miniatures are often overlooked 
in favour of the larger and more bombastic life-size oil painting, which dominates the visual legacy of the Qajar kings. As a result, the royal body is mostly confined to canvas in scholarship, with its power read as analogous to the size with which it is depicted. What an alternative case study of miniature portraits allows us to do is to read this power with greater nuance, with more attention paid to its gendered implications, where the associated authority of regal masculinity is apparent beyond the imposition of size, and instead can relate to subtle material and corporeal interrelation between imperial men and other men's bodies, be they noble or holy, that was achieved without actual bodily contact. This contact resulted in parallels being drawn between male personages of varying degrees of power, depending on who was doing the wearing and who was being worn, creating a sliding scale of loyalty, fraternity and even sacralization by association. For want of time, of course, there are many other aspects that come to bear on a reading of Qajar portrait miniatures as inherently gendered objects. Um, I welcome any questions that you may have, um, and I hope to cover such points that may remain outstanding. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Natasha, for this very interesting and rich uh, seminar. Um, small objects that open up big fields. <laughs> <laughs> so please do write your questions or points in the chat. Um, maybe while we're waiting, um, I can ask you a question. Um, uh, I, was, I was wondering, you know, in who the audience for these miniature uh, portraitures was, um, how were they seen? Uh, some of them have inscriptions, but very small, of course, and some, if, I, if I'm right, don't. So mm -hmm. they, they need a visual reference to be identified, understood, a, a different, another visual reference. I, I wonder whether you can say something about that. Yeah, so, I mean, the question of audience is an interesting one, primarily because of the size of these things. Um, as I said, you know, in the lecture, they demand a very kind of intimate, close inspection to actually take in the whole detail of the of the object um, both in terms of its decoration and in terms of the figuration in the center you know to work out who is being or what is being worn um, you would need to look quite closely and I think this is um, an issue that would come up both if you were viewing the miniature in real life being worn by someone and also if you're viewing it as it is reinscribed in a, another portrait. Um, you would have to operate kind of at two levels of distance in order to, to take it in. Um, not only that, but how it would then, you know, become potentially swallowed up um, in the ornateness of imperial regalia, um, as it is kind of very similar in its embellishment um, to the rest of the costuming. Um, I think when we're looking at comparative traditions of portrait miniatures, particularly in, in the European context, these objects were inherently, you know, very personal. They were things that were exchanged, you know, between one or two people. They were often commissioned, especially um, as kind of mementos or keepsakes. They didn't necessarily always have a public function, which is something which, I've read at least into, into the Qajar versions, it should, seems to be very specific to their um, context and use in the Persian court is, is something that's very public, something that's never kind of put away in a drawer or worn underneath something or um, kind of those manners of a very, yeah, kind of personal, um, intimate procurement and, and display, um, which aren't really displayed at all. Um, so it's their publicness that I found really interesting and it's their publicness which um, in terms of an audience you know the audience was potentially everybody <laughs> who was either to be gifted one or to come into a contact with one. Um, I think it's very telling that Queen Victoria 
in Owa's photograph wearing the miniature rather than simply receiving it, although it was later cannibalised into a necklace. Um, so she obviously wasn't that attached to it. Um, but again, to, to wear it in, in the same mode as those who had conferred it on her was a statement in itself. Yes, I um, thought that was very interesting, that photo that you showed, yeah. Yeah, so I think I think very much, yeah, at least in, in their Persian iterations, the, the audience is, is intended to be one that would be able to make and conflate those relationships between um, the person depicted and the person who was wearing them. So that relationship had to be very legible. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's partially, although, you know, we don't have anything that says very, very specifically this was who was intended to see a portrait miniature. Um, they do have very specific um, behaviours associated with them. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions in the chat. So Suheila says, uh, what is the relationship between Kajar miniatures and Elizabeth the first miniatures? Thank you for a brilliant talk. Merci. Oh, thank you very much. This is this is a really good question. So Elizabethan miniatures are probably the most immediate point of comparison um, to the Kajar examples. This is partially because of that kind of genealogy that scholarship has drawn out with um, European examples being kind of circulated within not only the Persian court, but also the Mughal court and the Ottoman court. And the examples would have been a mixture of kind of contemporary and also Elizabethan examples of portrait miniatures. Um, so formally, at least, there are obviously um, similarities uh, in the kind of construction of these things, um, the framing and the central roundel. But again, the behaviours and the context of their creation are very different. Um, Elizabethan portrait miniatures have an interesting kind of gendered um, nature in that they were a very masculine craft, but it was kind of a, to, to make and commission one was a, almost a kind of romantic sensitive act, if you see what I mean. Um, the act of limning um, was something that was bound up in kind of lyrical, um, chivalric uh, practices of, of masculinity um, that are, again, you know, different um, to, the, to the Kajar situation. So, they're an interesting um, comparative point, you know, things like Nicholas Hilliard and, and um, kind of portraits of, of Elizabethan courtiers, again, were, were commissioned as um, kind of affectionate markers um, within the court, though it's very, it was much more kind of democratised in terms of, of who could be the subject of a miniature in a way that you don't see um, reflected in, in Persian miniatures, they're very much kind of a very specifically elite um, endeavour with, with only, you know, a select couple um, of people, um, you know, considered worthy of, of being a miniature, most notably the Shah um, and his predecessors. So, no, it's an interesting, this is something which um, I draw out in the chapter, um, but kind of, yeah, demands kind of a greater, more nuanced um, investigation by the time I end up turning it into a chapter. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question because it's one of the main comparison points that when you're looking at portrait miniatures, you come up against. Thank you. Um, Giada Vercelli says, thank you very much, Dr. Morris, wonderful talk. Do you define the traits of masculinity you discussed also in comparison to female gendered objects in the Kajar court? Thank you. Again, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, there was actually a specific order, um, the order of As Aftab or Sunshine, um, which was created for women within the Khajar court. Um, and this basically had that fe feminized sun face, um, 
within kind of a, a greater sunburst of diamonds usually i think i've got a picture of one if i zoom back it's yes. not terribly big but it's right it's the one that's um above the number two hmm. so these were made and conferred especially for women in the Qajar court um but it's interesting that they're not given a specific persona to connect with they're given a national emblem and I think this is probably there's probably um a greater point to be made here in terms of a gendered conceptualization of nationhood and this is something that um the work of Asfane Najwabadi does really really well um in looking at kind of the the way that national symbols were gendered in the Qajar period and kind of the, the literal changing face um, of the lion and sun, Khanume Koshi. So um, the other kind of point of comparison that I bring out here would be miniatures of uh, kind of beautiful youths um, that again are not a specific person, they're not a portrait or a likeness of, um, of an actual living being. Um, they're more these kind of romanticized figures that you would have found in single sheet painting or um, manuscript painting kind of in the early modern period. Um, they're kind of the, the direct um, relatives of, of that. Um, and again, you find these kind of transferred over things like um, pipes, um, again, pen boxes, uh, things like that. And I think those objects are much more explicitly feminized or female coded um, rather than uh, rather than the, the portrait miniature, the imperial effigy, for example, or a, a Shemayel. So they did exist like portrait miniatures for ladies, um, but they weren't in the same iteration as as uh, as these. You wouldn't have had a a portrait miniature of a of a king for example um being kind of kept like a lover's locket is it <laughs> um it wouldn't that that wasn't again it was a very kind of public um statement to be conferred amongst men thank you um so uh, i hope that there will be other questions please write them in the in the chat um while we're waiting, maybe I can ask you another question. Um, you showed us that the, the, the they were wearing these miniature uh, portraits of their predecessors or ancestors, and I think you also said that you that that were also worn by the individuals themselves, but but rare. If I'm oh, so correct, I mean. Like, like almost in a self-referential way. I wonder whether you can expand on that, if I well understood. I think um, I'll probably clarify that a bit more. I think uh, the part that you're referring to is um, the the rareness of the likeness of Muhammad Shah. Oh, right, okay. Portraits. So yeah, you wouldn't have had um, someone wearing a portrait of themselves. Right. You know, it's not for granted that that doesn't happen. No, well, I wouldn't have put it past Nasruddin Shah to be honest, because he had so many going on. And as I say, the amount of stuff that you find even now with um, with his face on it is amazing. It's kind of a, a pop culture phenomenon now as much as it was once uh, an image and object of, of uh, great value um but no i haven't found any examples of someone wearing themselves um it, it's only those kind of changing um behaviors kind of between muhammad shah and um nasruddin shah where you have you know muhammad shah is very very attached to this image of fat ali shah virtually most portraits of him you will see him sporting a miniature whereas nasruddin um you know the the references to muhammad shah aren't there at all his concern is with with imam ali and kind of integrating this um gesture of personal piety into his uh, into his imperial image which he does through 
you know, creating his own kind of order of portrait miniatures. Um, but yeah, no, sorry if that wasn't terribly no, clear, no, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very much. So Maria Mechtia says, thank you for a stimulating talk. And then Flaskerud says, if the miniatures express how the Shah wants to be seen by others, mm. are there are specific iconographic or symbolic differences for intended audiences. Thank you for a great talk. Oh, that's a great point. Let me just write this down. Can you see that's... the chat or shall I repeat it? I can <laughs> see it in the chat. If, yeah. if the miniatures express how the Shah wants to be seen by others, are there specific iconographic or symbolic differences for intended audiences? I think this is something that I wouldn't be able to answer in the fullness I would want to at this stage. But it's something that I think would be particularly important carrying what was the chapter of my dissertation forward into a book because I think it's something very important. Um, Again, I haven't kind of examined, I've examined when you see these things, but not where. So that would entail kind of looking at the audiences for where portrait, you can see portrait miniatures being reinscribed, perhaps if there's changes in um, instances of portraiture of, of Nasruddin Shah, for example, in the combinations of the orders that he's wearing or um, in the kind of fineness and details of, of particular uh, miniatures. And then if you can find an equivalent, perhaps in real life, an extant example that, you know, can make that kind of direct link. Um, but no, I'm afraid that's something that, yeah, I would have to delve into a bit more to give you a, a very specific answer. But hopefully I'll be able to answer that when I get around to... Out. Thank you. Uh, Caroline Mauer says, were these portrait miniatures passed on to descendants? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. It's, I think when we see um, examples of, of them being worn, uh, you there's a difficulty in <clears throat> discerning whether something was commissioned at the time for us, you know, a specific, again, this kind of uh, links into the, the previous question. Um, if something was commissioned for a particular event, for example, mm -hmm. you have no way of knowing when it's reinscribed in a portrait, whether this thing was passed down from Fat Ali Shah to Muhammad Shah, or whether Muhammad Shah commissioned a picture of his grandfather to be worn, if you see what I mean, without having uh, an example. Um, of the miniature itself that's existing in a collection somewhere. Um, with the actual objects themselves, of course, you can date them and see where they've come from. And the obviously they they circulated um, within the you know the court. They they were kind of part of the uh, imperial costuming for for quite some time. So we can deduce that they would have been conferred from son to grandson to um, father and in, in kind of a, a manner that reflects their purpose of dynastic continuity in the way that they were then conferred onto or conferred onto each other. And I think that that's an in, intrinsic part of them being symbolic of these kind of patrilineal and um, kind of broader concepts of, of um, dynastic linkage you see what I mean so those exchanges would be important if you could you know really solidly pin down kind of uh, trajectories of exchange thank you um are there any other questions otherwise thank you so much um Natasha applause. <laughs> <laughs> and um I'm I'm looking forward to see you again um, on the 16th of December uh, for our last race of the term with Maximilian Hartmut. And um, thank you very much, Natasha, for this wonderful talk. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.